she writes about this archaeological team who go to Greenland and they are looking at an excavation of Norsemen who have died in 1400 and weirdly enough while this is happening they have just realized that there is a virus going around this is in 2009 hi everyone welcome to chalchitra talks mera naam bani hai and for this episode i had the opportunity to sit down with ira mukhote who is an absolutely brilliant person yes but she's also written some very nice and interesting books daughters of the sun akbar the great mogul and uh, heroines and quite recently song of thrapathy we discussed books at length of course but we also spoke about how books have the power of changing perspective without wasting further time let's just jump right in hi ira welcome to chalchitra talks Hi Vani, thank you for having me. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, pretty good. Yeah. How about you? I'm fine as well. I'll just straight away jump to the questions, and I want to know what are you reading right now? Strangely for me, because I don't read science fiction. I haven't read science fiction for many, many years. I used to love right. science fiction when I was a very young woman, and I read a lot at that time. Then I stopped completely. It's just one of those things, you know. And recently, somebody that I, you know, uh, I like a lot and think very highly of said that the best book she had ever, ever read, read the best. you know all told all the genres mixed up is this book by uh, it's a classic by ursula le guin called the left hand of darkness i have been reading that uh, after many it's been written 50 years ago so i'm a little bit uh, late to the party here <laughs> but uh, it's a nice change from the non fiction that i usually read you know pretty heavy going stuff so this is interesting it's also said for those who haven't read it it's set um, in a society which does not have it's genderless basically so for like uh, three weeks or three and a half weeks of the month these people have no gender they are neither male nor female they kind of uh, embody both gender so how does a society perform and act when they are not sort of ruled by the desires and the impulsions of sex and gender so that's a very interesting take on the, the whole story i'm finding that quite interesting i got introduced to her because of a short story called those who walk away from omlas i'm not sure if i'm getting the name of the city right okay. but it's yeah. very very interesting so there's a city called omlas okay. and it's a very happy city like it's the ultimate city you want to live in work yeah. in everyone's very happy but the basis of the happiness is that there is one child who is always going to suffer oh my always god always going to suffer okay and now, I'm, i'm hating this already yes <laughs> And now the thing is, uh, when you actually come to realize it, and you're a resident of Omlas, do you do anything to save that child, knowing that right. you'll become just another city, or do you walk away from it? Oh my god! Or do you just goodness. let it be the way it is? So right. the whole story is about it. Okay, so um, that's interesting. Yeah. that she's a writer who really questions the very fabric of our society what do we base our societies on on gender or on suffering you know that that's pretty mm-hmm. interesting i might try this after the left hand of that yeah. do you also read any other science fiction i tell you what um, the thing is you know uh, I, i'm a writer so this is my primary skill let us say <laughs> so you know like anybody who has you know something that they value that that they do in their lives you know supposing somebody rides motorbikes or have a car they're going to look after that car and that motorbike so my only skill is writing so i have to look after my thoughts in my brain and stuff so i'm careful about what i read um and <laughs> so i make it a mix of non fiction which is important for my work so i see how other people handle non fiction um and also there's so many interesting stories and but i also read a lot of literary fiction So I try and keep it half and half, but I cheat, and I it's mostly one is to three, so three literary fiction to each uh, non-fiction. <laughs> What are your favorite authors in terms of non-fiction? So non-fiction, it is you see, it's not really author-based. It'll be uh, mostly because I do tend to read a lot around uh, work as well. Uh, so it'll be whoever's writing. So for for example, Richard Eaton has written so well about India and India and the Persian Eight Age, for example. So he's one of my favorite writers of historical non-fiction. But then I do read non-fiction in a lot of other genres, which may not be your typical, you know, what you might think of as non-fiction. So, for example, there is this woman 
called um, Helen Garner. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's this Australian mm-hmm. writer. She's a journalist by training. And what she's made a career out of really is writing journalistic stories. So when she hears about some extraordinary event that's happened in some little town in Australia, for example, there was this terrible incident of a man driving into a lake with his four, three or four children and the children all die and he survives. Everybody was very, you know, agog about this. There was a lot of effervescence in the press that did he do this on purpose because he had gone through a messy divorce. So she actually went to the courts, followed the stories, listened to the pros and cons, listened to the defense and the, you know, the way the trial was carried out. She took notes and she wrote this extraordinary book called In This House of Grief. Uh, in which she also goes into the backstories. She interviews the mother and the father, and she really tries to get at the core of the story. What happened that day? Why did this man do this? What happened in his past? What happened during the divorce? So it is nonfiction, but it is very a very different sort of nonfiction. So she's one of my all-time favorite. You can pick up most of her books, even a book called Jo Chinque's Consolation, where this Indian origin girl murders her boyfriend again in Australia, why does she do this? What are the, you know, connotation, racist mm-hmm. connotation behind this whole trial? So fascinating because she brings the human element into things. And another writer uh, that I really like is, um, well, I, I just read the one book by her. It's uh, a woman called Tara Westover. She wrote Educated about growing up in this sect in America. It's a sort of end of the world kind of sect where they're, you know, they're convinced that the government is out to get you. So you must survive on your own in the wilderness. You don't send your children to school. You do everything yourself basically you know you, you survive on your own but this girl grows up without an education so what it does to her to her childhood and how she comes out of it it's a pretty extraordinary book so I read very widely uh, outside of my work and it's so I don't particularly have a favorite favorite author per se you know whoever comes out whoever's you know uh, written about in the news if I like the sound of it I'll pick it up and what about literary fiction? What are your favorites? It's always difficult to talk of favorites because I think it depends a lot on um, your phase in life, like what you're going through, how right. old you are, you know, the, the the experiences that you are having. So, uh, like, for example, when I was a very young woman, the first writer who had this extraordinary impact on me was Toni Morrison, you know, when I read her. Because after having read all of this, um, English origin fiction, you know, that we grew up on Enid Blyton and, uh, you know, Agatha Mm. Christie and all this typical sort of writing. Suddenly I came across this voice who was writing in English, but it seemed like a different language because the way in which she was manipulating the words and the emotions, you know, uh, and the story she was telling us about what somebody can do when faced with, um, you know, terrible violence, you know, the the sort of uh, violence that the Black Americans went through. Uh, So when I read Beloved, it completely completely shattered my notions of how you need to write in English. Then I went on to Naipaul and Rushdie, especially who does that in the Indian context, people like Rohinta Mistri who write about India in their own, you know, using their own phrases and words and, you know, manipulating. But Toni Morrison was really the first person who did that because if you just just when you read her book, never mind what she's talking about, which is so shattering and it's just the way she uses the language the way she claims the English language and makes it hers, makes it that of African-Americans. And I thought, okay, this is something that I can really understand and really resonates with me. You know, living in India, we we interact with language in a very different way. We don't use the same phrases, you know. We do not have the same idea of the rhythm of words and the cadence of, of, of sentences. So it really sort of set me on this journey of finding out how do I, if ever I write, how will I write? How do I, what is my relationship with words? And why should it be only English, you know, by sort of dictated by the, the, the way the English write? So then I got exposed to people who were very non-English. So I read a lot of Australian authors, a lot of Irish authors who are fantastic in the way in which there was this young woman who won the one of the big prizes, the Booker Prize, I think. Um, and her book is called um, A Girl is a Half form thing and she have an unpronounceable Irish name but she's extraordinary it's almost uh, you know James Joyce like the way she writes a, a, you know a stream of consciousness but just the way in which you can see that love for the language but we interpret it through a different cultural background so these sort of authors who challenge the way in which we think about just the language itself have have really been influential but then uh, like I was saying you know when you're growing up you have certain people have an influence on you um, then uh, I went through a you know, phase of my life I lost my parents so the the bereavement became very important to me how do people express bereavement you know uh, and I read a book called the Tibetan book of the dead 
And so, you know, that was a book which was very important to me at that stage of life. Uh, I read Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking of writing about how she lost her husband, what happened to her. So, you know, how do people deal with grief? That was something that I was interested in. So I think it's normal. It happens to everybody, depending on what your experiences are, what you're going through in your own life. People will resonate with you depending on what they're writing about. So at each decade of my life, I've had different, even like five years of my life, I've changed, you know, my favorite okay. authors. Yeah. What are the books that you are really enjoying right now in this phase of your life, especially in this, literary fiction? You know, I just sat down and I was just listing out the names of the books that I've, you know, enjoyed and, you know, in the past year or whatever. So I, I do this every year. And I noticed that in the past 10 years or so approximately, 90% of the books that I have been reading and really liking have been written by women. And this is absolutely not something that I go out to do. I just look at recommendation. I read samples because on Kindle now it's fantastic. You can read a sample chapter. If you don't like it, you dump it. You don't have to have all those unread books stacked up right in your house. And I just found that the writings that really resonated with me were written by women. And I think it's just that when you come to a phase in your life, you find that, you know, it's no longer the huge story deeds that are of great interest. You know, you're not that interested in going out and conquering the world, maybe on those huge adventures that you might have liked earlier. Now, I do really enjoy the smaller things, the highly focused, intimate searches, let us say. There is this writer called Sarah Moss that I really enjoyed. Uh, she's written a bunch of books. And the last one that I read, it's a book called Cold Earth. And she writes about this uh, archaeological team who go to Greenland and they are um, looking at an excavation of Norsemen who have died in 1400. And why did they die? Was it disease? Were they attacked? What happened? What happened in their society? And weirdly enough, while this is happening, while these five or six people have left their homes to come to this very isolated place in Greenland, they're completely out of touch. There's no Wi-Fi, there's no communication. They have just uh, realized that there's a virus going around. This is in 2009. And there's this huge yeah. virus which seems to be global because it's spreading from place to place and it's potentially very lethal. But they've left their homes in the middle of that situation and come to this very isolated place. So how do they carry on with the exploration, knowing in their minds that their families may even be dead by the time they finish their nine weeks or whatever time they're spending in, in Greenland? So I really like this writer and I write, like her genre a lot because she really focuses on the human drama, you know, the small dramas, maybe even family relationships and I just find that that is the sort of thing that these days I'm more attracted than than by the big glorious deeds. Whenever I buy a book there are just certain things that I really notice the cover is one but there's yeah. also this the first page there are a lot of people who really love the first pages I really go for dedications Do you have a favorite <laughs> dedication um uh, a dedication or is this something else that you notice in a book and yeah yeah something? for sure yeah. dedications are important i mean you know ever since i started writing and thinking a lot about who i have to checklist in my dedication <laughs> i just think it humanizes the author it does. <laughs> all it of does. a sudden and you realize oh that's a person writing a book. exactly exactly and people you know often say of course dedicate them to their family their children and things like that but one uh, I remember because it really made me laugh is and I don't remember who it was but they had dedicated their book and they had a whole like in the entire front page typefaced was filled with names of publishers and he said I do not dedicate it to any of these publishers who rejected my manuscript <laughs> and that made me laugh more because it was a really good book it had done really well and all those publishers had rejected it <laughs> This book is not dedicated to ABCD and he had listed out all the names. So <laughs> I found really that nice. pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. This reminds me of a dedication which comes from this book called Love Poems for Married Couples. And the dedication is to, uh, and there are about 10, 15 names of women, all of them crossed out. Like Mary, Mary, Sarah, etc. And then Nietzsche, <laughs> there is a final word. Like it's not crossed out. That's probably the wife and the girl he eventually <laughs> married. <laughs> it's oh, very, very a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> yeah. There's this book by um, Maria Popova. She runs Brain Pickings. She published this book called uh, Velocity of Being. And okay. in it, she collected the letters of some of the finest authors we've had, some of the finest okay. painters we've had. She collected the letters and she's, the letters were addressed to kids as to why they should read. Oh, and wow. there are okay. different letters, like uh, there is one by this guy, I can't remember who it was, was but he says, you should read because everyone around you loves you, but they might not understand you. 
Uh-huh. But there will be a time when you'll pick up a book and across years, there'll be somebody who will understand you. And yeah. that reason has stayed with me. Do you also yeah. have a reason for reading? Or do you, is there a letter, if you were to write a letter, what yeah. would be your reason? Like, why should people read? I think that's an excellent reason, though, the one that you just uh, explained. And I think the, f- the way I see it is that, you know, I'm one person, we are all our own individuals, we have a certain life, we have a trajectory that will follow its course because of where we are born, because of the gender we have, because of the society or culture, we are the land, the country we are living in, there are certain experiences that we will have and there are many, many, many others that we will never have, no matter how open we are, how much we travel, we will never have the entire gamut of human experience. But I feel that reading expands that gamut for us, you know, if we are able to empathize with somebody, for example, we did I'm reading a book called this is how it always is, or something like that, I think. Um, it's about this a parent who has had three boys, and the fourth child is born a boy, but they find as the child is growing up that actually she's identifying as female. You know, so they go through this turmoil in their life, but they deal with it with so much grace and humanity. And I, it really made me think, you know, it made me think, how would I have brought up a child who felt that they were in, you know, they were another gender? How would I have dealt with it? How would society have reacted to that? So I really feel that reading takes us out of our own comfort, comfort zones and helps us to empathize with the world, with humanity in all its glorious kind of chaotic, uh, you know, diversity. Yeah. And if we were not to read and just carry on with our life, we would never see how the challenges that other people go through, what it is like to be, like, for example, for me, just a woman from a, you know, from a privileged, easy background who hasn't had to struggle. If I didn't read all these books, I would not empathize with the human condition to the extent that I do. So I think it's really important to read because it just helps you to to have a more, uh, a wider sense of what humanity means, you know, what it means to be human. So this brings me to my next question, because you said you have two girls, and that reminded me of an author I absolutely love, and she's someone I've recommended on every possible stream and episode last year. Okay. Uh, her name is Deborah Levy, and she's written this oh, yeah. three-part autobiography okay. of her life. Yeah. So the first part is about her 40s. It's called yeah. Things I Don't Want to Know. The second part okay. is about her 50s called Cost of Living. And yeah. the third part is about her 60s, which is called The Real Estate. I haven't read the 60s because I okay. couldn't relate to that. Yeah. Uh, but she also has two daughters. And she and her writings actually changed the way I look at myself, about women around me, yeah. um, how I look at my mother or my grandmother, women in general. And I think that was the turning point of feminism for me. I know you've read so much about women in history, women Mm -hmm. in mythology, etc. How has that changed your perspective of women? I don't know if there was exactly a turning point per se, but I think it's been a gradual realization through my life. I think I was quite young when I read Naomi Wolf's The Beauty Myth. And, you know, Naomi Wolf is not controversial. She said all sorts of crazy things. But The Beauty Myth was still a very groundbreaking book for young girls growing up and understanding the way in which the very idea of beauty is a patriarchal construct. It is made to deprive us of our liberty, our money, because we spend all our money on these products, you know. Uh, So it really, really influenced me to such a great degree at that time you know and I think it stayed with me all my life this realization of how patriarchy really controls women's minds and bodies and then after that I read people uh, you know like Chimamanda Adichie who also writes very movingly in Americana she writes about her what it is to be uh, you know an African woman living in America and there is this imagery she often talks about her hair you know, about how she struggles all her life to tame her hair because she has this untamable afro, which is her natural hair. And yet to fit into society in America, she has to straighten it, make it look as European as possible to get better jobs, to be accepted by people. And so it really stayed with me, you know, this idea of how just the things that we are born with, the extents that we go to, to try and fit into society and alter those that the reality of what we are. Hair on women has been a theme that I've been very interested in, even in my book, Song of Draupadi, I talk about yes. Draupadi's hair and how she leaves it untamed and it's how powerful a signal that is to her husband. What it means in India, it means you're an undomesticated woman if you have, you know, wild, uncombed hair. So you see, at different part, times of my life, I have And and the more I read about this, the more open I I was to it and the more I sought out books. So I read a book uh, by 
Caroline Criado Perez, I think a few years ago, called Invisible Women, in which she writes about, she's analyzed data gathering in the world. And she says, even things like data is gathered in a gendered manner. So when we build a car, for example, you know, the, safe, the basic safety features in the car, they're built for your average man. Uh, so when women are, are involved in accidents in a car, they are much more catastrophically injured because that basic safety features are geared for, say, you know, a 5, 10, 60 kg man, whereas where many women are like 50 kg and are much smaller. So they get much more injured because it is assumed that your average person in a car is going to be made. Um, your phone is too big for a woman's palm because they have, it's been designed for a man's palm. Everything around us, the, the, the temperature that offices are set around the world are set to an, a mean an average man's mm -hmm. body weight and comfort. So we are always feeling cold in offices because we feel colder at those temperatures. So it was really another moment for me where I realized that even in something which should be so unbiased as data gathering and, and inter interpretation is actually completely biased. So we have to be, so I've just become increasingly sensitized to this issue. Uh, and so if I pick up a book or, uh, you know, nonfiction, or if I look at a, even a, a movie or, you know, a, a series, if it is entirely from a male point of view and there are no ma you know, major female characters, I'm not going to be interested in that because we've done too much of that. We have focused on things just too much from the male point of view, completely writing out 50% of, of you know, women from history, from entertainment, from the way in which we present them in society, movies. So I, I just feel that enough is enough. So now I always orient towards uh, you know, movies and books and, and things which, which, which represent women. Are there also any uh, particular things that you like to watch, TV shows, movies? that are especially yeah. women-centric. I, I guess, again, it's not on purpose. Like I said, you know, I just realized to my own astonishment that 90% of the books I've read in the past 10 years are by female authors. I really did yeah. not do this consciously. Even in, say, I think TV shows more, I don't, I don't go out to the movies a great deal. Uh, but we do watch a fair number now that is so easy and there's such high quality entertainment in terms of TV series and stuff like that, you know. So I do find that uh, I am drawn to not only, not female only, but at least we should have an equal number. There should be, you know, important female characters in the stories being told. But luckily there is, I think it is changing now and we do have, uh, you know, a, a lot more. Like uh, my daughters were recommending and then because of that I watched Bombay Begums. And I thought, you know, initially I thought, okay, am I going to like this? But I was just astonished at the way in which women were represented. You know, this is Bollywood, this is India, and you would not expect maybe to see women shown like this. But I was pretty pleasantly surprised. I was like, okay, things are finally changing, you know, <laughs> away from things. And yeah. yeah. I have a book recommendation for you. It's I am not sure if you've read it. It's called In Search of Our Mother's Garden and it's by Alice Walker. It's actually a black woman's response to Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. Yeah, so okay. So I think cost of living is a reply to essay, A Room of One's Own. And okay. In Search of Our Mother's Garden is a black woman's response to the same thing. And she argues that this is not possible for a black woman. And I think oh, you would really me. enjoy it. I think I will. Yeah, I think we are talking so much more about the, you know, the intersection of race and gender and race, uh, you know, when we talk about feminism. So it's very important uh, to read books like this. So I'm going to make a note of it and read it. So thank you for that. Do you also watch any other TV shows just for fun, just for relaxation? One that I liked recently, which was really uh, unexpected, is something called White Lotus. It is set in this beautiful resort. So there's the, all these American tourists coming to this beautiful resort. I think it's on Hawaii. Uh, and on the, you have all these wealthy people coming in to, 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 to enjoy the resort. It's a beautiful, typical resort, okay. you know, beachside resort. But it really shows us uh, with such, you know, cutting humor, but also dark truths about how we've commercialized, uh, you know, all these experiences for the white person's consumption and the cost of that commercialization. One series that it has a lot of bad language, so I have to warn you, all your listeners. Um, but one that was made in India, which I really thought was quite astonishing, was uh, Mirzapur. And yeah. I thought that was like, you know, uh, I live in Gurgaon, so Haryana and all that sort of thing. And it sort of reminded me of some of these villages. And I was like, yes, I can see this happening. You know, so for a Delhi person and even us in Gurgaon in our little fiefdoms, you know, of safety and comfort, we cannot imagine that outside <laughs> there is this world also. But so I thought it was very brilliantly done. 
Do you also listen to music or podcasts? Podcasts, um, I didn't used to listen to so much, but I have started, uh, you know, again late to the party. But I have been enjoying some of the some of the podcasts. Uh, I think I was on a podcast, which is why I found out about Amit Verma and his The Seen oh. and the Unseen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I did one with him a couple of years ago and firstly he's such an extraordinarily clever intelligent man I don't know how he remembers I said I, I mean I barely remember my own work like when somebody introduced me about an yeah. earlier work I'm like what did I really write that oh my god what did I mean <laughs> I think you're talking yes. to like sometimes six seven people in a week you know absorbing all that information so an extraordinary man really uh, very pleasant and lovely as well um, and so I have like I've been enjoying you know some of his podcasts after that yes. uh, and also this young man called Anirudh Kanisetti whom uh, who has got this big book you know Lord of the Deccans and he has a podcast called Echoes of India which is a really fun easy to understand take on you know on his Indian history uh, and then uh, the another podcast on history which I was introduced to I think William Dalrymple mentioned it in one of his recommendations is called uh, it's with Tom Holland and it's called The Rest is History and it's really okay. fun because it's a non-scholarly take it's these two guys who are almost uh, you know flippant about all these great major events and they you know keep challenging each other's points of views yeah. and they bring alternative points of views uh, and I found that really I, I think it's part of this whole process of making history more sexy and more accessible and more you know vibrant this reminded me of this podcast I can't remember who the host is but it's called Noble Blood and in every episode somebody dies <laughs> um, and <laughs> it's actually about how royals Um, yeah. Some of them were found at the wrong place at the wrong time, or okay. were gossiping, or slept with the wrong person, and that's how yeah. they died. But the whole they died, episode, okay. <laughs> yes, it's about royals and their deaths, the funniest okay. deaths, <laughs> uh, not the funniest, but like the weirdest deaths and how they met their ends. Fabulous! It's, it sounds fantastic. I'm going to <laughs> and it's it's well, usually I think each episode is less than thirty minutes, so it's very okay. interesting. Very interesting. Well, the first one, I think the very first I got into were those uh, criminal and serial, you know, about yes. serial killers. Those were fabulously done. So I have to say, you know, I mean, it's a very dark subject again, and it's true life and it's true criminals. But the way that in which they get into the stories and how, you know, what we think uh, they challenge the notion Absolutely. of, you know, who's guilty and who is a victim. So I thought those were very well done as well. How about... Museums. Do you have any favorite museums that you'd like to recommend to people? I'm very fond of museums. Uh, you know, uh, and when I travel, especially when I go uh, to a new place, a new city, I always try and you know figure out the museums to see. And um, now, in, unfortunately, in India, there aren't a great deal. You know that are done very well. Like even the right. National Museum, it has such fabulous, uh, you know, artifacts and so much stuff. But it's just not presented in a way which grabs our attention as you know in the west they do try and do so much more you know with what right. they have well recently i was in jaipur for the literature festival and we went to see this uh, the this museum which has been uh, curated and put together by pramod kumar who is this fantastic curator you know so it's it's on the, it's a private collection it's um, a jewelry it's basically using all the jewelry of uh, of rajasthan and you know they put it so well that there's a story running through it and what happens through the ages how does all this jewelry change and you know what right. it tells us about uh, about people and a fascinating bit of it was uh, you know all these jewelry that that women wear that almost seem like chains like fetters because they're wearing these uh, anklets which are you know ki- kilos heavy and they're they're thick and they just kind of shackle their legs and you, you almost think that this kind of heavy jewelry again it ties into my work is we are shackling women we are doma- we literally tying them to the hearts you know, when we actually cannot move because we have jewelry right up your arm jewelry on your legs they're almost like yeah. shackles very interesting to see how the way the way in which all these things evolve so that was a nice museum that i saw in case somebody wants to pick up and try and understand paintings and the concept of a lot of artwork what would your recommendation be where should they start from and why yeah. should they start from there anything written by by professor b n goswami is fantastic you know he is really our best living art historian now in india and he has just a fabulous fabulous sensitive take on on art so anything written by him is great uh but i would almost suggest if people want to actually understand now we have so much available online in terms of talks you know because of this whole pandemic a lot of wonderful experts have come online to give lectures so, and if you can track down anything by uh, professor kavita singh she is an art historian 
in JNU. And she talks okay. so lucidly and well. And she's written a book, Imagine Birds in Beard Garden. So she writes with great nuance and, uh, you know, sensitive interpretation about Mughal painting. Because the way in which a lay person would look at a Mughal painting and understand it is entirely different once you get an insider's point of view, an expert's point of view. This is a question I like to ask everyone. How do you unwind? Like, what's your unwinding routine like at the end of the day? I think because I'm sitting for such a long time at my desk, you know, when I'm writing, and even when I'm doing research, it's it's just, it's, you know, you're just immobile, you're at a desk, you're in a certain location. So I think for me, unwinding means to go out and walk. And, you know, if I'm close to nature, then so much the rest of a garden or anything with with just something which is not human made, you know, not a construction, just to get away into a space which is more wild. I think that is very, very freeing and unwinding. It also helps settle your thoughts. So I do that at the end of the day, if, if at all possible, weather permitting and where, depending on where I am. A lot of people who watch us uh, also like to write and love to write. And there okay. are so many of them who are trying to pick up writing. Okay. So this is one advice with this is we've sort of got very conflicted advices from a couple of people. Like some people tell you like, oh, write every day. Yeah. And then there are people who say, write only when inspiration hits. What works for you? What works for me? I have to say I'm more uh, on the write every day school of thinking. <laughs> Because, you know, if you wait for the right moment, for the right inspiration, it never happens, you know, and then you procrastinate and you put it out, you you, you look for a trickier and trickier, you know, uh, situations to arrive, and it never happens. And writing is, is extremely hard, I'm not going to lie. It takes a lot of discipline. You think, okay, you're waiting there and you get this perfect inspiration, perfect phrase, and you start writing it down. It's not. You just sit at a blank place yeah. and you throw the words onto the paper. That is literally, you know, you take this leap of faith and you just start writing. And a lot of it is rubbish. But if you don't get started, um, you just don't know. You don't know what you're capable of. You don't know that you can improve. You don't know what you can create. For me, uh, in the writing phase of it, because I'm a, since I write non-fiction, uh, I also have a research phase where all I'm doing is gathering information. So then I don't write. Uh, but when I'm writing, I write every day. So I put myself a target, you know, a, a realistic target. Um, 1,500, 2,000 words a day, let us say. Um, and mm-hmm. I read read it the next day in the morning, first thing, and half of it I'll throw out, but I still have half, which is worth keeping on, and then I add another 1,500. So it is literally uh, word by word. It's hard graft. It's not uh, an easy thing that, ha ha, today I'm sitting in the studio, <laughs> I'm going to write. No, you know, you yeah. need your, the place where you're comfortable in. It's just, you know, it can be something quite dreary, but something where you feel happy working, and you just get to that space, and you just throw out the words. There's just no other way. You also mentioned research do you have a, a process of making notes like i um, remember we were having yeah. this conversation with anjal malhotra Oops. and i love her note making her notebook gives me such you know terrible <laughs> vibes about myself i'm like anjal what are you doing to me like if you see my notes and if you see anjal notes you think these are two alien species i'm like <laughs> how do you keep such beautiful notes mine i cannot read them by the end of the day you know she keeps beautiful notes um, do you also have I, a process of making yeah, your own notes? Yeah, I do. I remember I'd spoken to Manu Pile once, you know, some years ago, and he said, listen, I give you all of us nonfiction writers read a lot, even if it's skimming, you know, when we have uh, yeah. meetings for work, we'll not be people, we'll be telling people, oh, you know, we read like a hundred books for, to write this one book, and it sounds very <laughs> impressive, but actually reading five pages out of that, uh, you know, the entire lot of books. So he said, listen, I just skim, I, I, I go through the books, and I keep making notes of interesting things interesting facts that may not be relevant to you today whatever you're working on but it's an interesting fact in itself one day it can be useful so he does that and I remember thinking that's a pretty good idea you know so now I do the same thing and I'm going through books uh, I keep constant notes like you know if ever my pen drive got stolen I'd, I'd be like a puddle of tears because all my work would be gone but <laughs> I keep making notes because you forget you think okay I'm going to remember and I'm going to read all this and I'll remember I'd, I'd be able to you know cohesively write about this that's not true you forget things entirely so we mm. i keep making notes as each book i read i make notes do you use any platform for it or do you just use word slash notepad plain old-fashioned notes yeah before we go is there anything that i might have missed and you want to talk about it yeah i wanted to say about in terms of reading some of the best uh experiences i've had uh recently and it just it's 
it's just lucky because of what I do is that I've been uh, you know lucky enough to talk to some of the writers like interview some of the great mm -hmm. writers around us and I did one I remember on and that was Stuart who wrote Shaggy Bain I think they wanted to interview him for the um, TOI Lit Fest and it just so happened that I had read his book so they said just you know, just speak to him uh, I said okay when do you want me to speak to him so they said in, by this evening that was six hours away I said this evening you want me to you know speak and interview the Pulitzer the book of prize winning uh, novelist they said yeah yeah don't worry it'll go very well he's a very nice man you just put all his interviews and all. so I did that I like you know came and did a crash course on Daniel Stewart and I talked to him about Shaggy Bain and it was so wonderful because you know we shared insights about his book which I would never have come across if I hadn't spoken to the author himself being able to meet the actual authors of certain books which are you know the big books uh, can be really really uh, wonderful and give you a new insight so that what were your most memorable meetings they've all been very very nice so I, unfortunately I can't give any uh, you know anecdotes about somebody having a temper tantrum. I spoke to somebody called Kate Summerscale. She's written this book uh, called The Haunting of Alma Fielding, which is a yes. fabulous book. You know, it's it's a nonfiction. It's about this woman in uh, the late 19th century, I think, uh, early 20th, uh, late 19th, I think, who has this poltergeist activity in her house. Like things start flying around, you know, yeah. uh, like household objects just start moving around and the whole neighborhood comes to hear of it and they come to, she becomes a, something of a local celebrity. I was speaking to Kate about it because she had done actual research, you know, into this background of yes. this woman because they had kept proper archives of the investigate. She was investigated by a scientific team. They came to measure her body and do experiments on her, kept her, you know, in a semi-induced condition to see what happened to her when she was in this state. And uh, so all these things happened to her. And um, she found all this information at the at one of the big museums library or somewhere she or I think it was in Cambridge all the information is kept in Cambridge um, and she was saying that she found a, you know a document uh, in that uh, uh, museum which kind of almost suggested to her that she should write this book so it was almost like a, a paranormal activity was happening mm -hmm. to her the researcher while she was writing it telling her she should do this book so there was an extra layer of sort of eeriness to the whole thing and then when I read the book I found it thoroughly entertaining i would really recommend it to your listeners as well so there is this woman that i spoke about earlier also maria popova and she runs this blog and she once talked about in one of her blogs about having pockets of stillness things that you don't do when everything else is perhaps overwhelming you or okay. is not going well so do you also have those pockets of stillness and what are those for you things that you go back to when you want reassurance in life you or perhaps to mind? just relax or do you physically go to a place in, or do you mean in your in life in general uh, i think it would be a favorite place uh, you know associated with my childhood i think because for a lot of us childhood is a time of generally speaking you know if you've had a happy childhood of serenity of uh, a sense of things being, uh, you know, uh, done, uh, controlled for you. So there's a, a certain feeling of safety uh, with yes. childhoods, in happy childhoods. So there is a place where I used to spend all my uh, summer holidays and it was a, you know, a beachside place and we'd go there year after year. And uh, somehow that was never dull as a child. You liked that repetition. You liked that expectation being met, you know. Uh, so it is that place. It is a very quiet and, and still place as well. So yeah, in my mind, I think I feel that, okay, if that still exists in the world and if, you know, it's still there, then everything is not as bad as it seems sometimes. Please subscribe to Chal Chitra Talks. This is a wonderful thing and Vani does a wonderful job. So please do. So.